Welcome to the London Horror Movie Club. I'm horror writer Lauren Jane Barnett. And I'm Chris Sapkowski, Lauren's older brother, and I've been watching horror movies since I was eight. Join us as we talk about the wild, weird, and wonderful horror films set in England's eerie capital. Hi, everybody. Ending our Hallow week of interviews with a bang. Joining Chris and I today is writer, editor, director, actor, producer, Tom Lee Rudder. He's directed more than 20 films, including Bella and the Witch Elm and Day of the Stranger. He's produced and written more than a dozen. And his latest feature film has come up quite a bit on our podcast, the surreal, eerie, and hilarious pocket film of Superstitions. Welcome, Tom. Thanks for having me, Lauren, Chris. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's Thank wonderful you. to have you. So I got to know, great, the introduction, you can tell you've done a little bit of everything, acted, directed, written, edited. What do you enjoy most and what do you find most challenging? Uh, it, 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 I think just the process of making films in general. I mean, because um, I'm from the DIY school of filmmaking, uh, much like I, I guess a few of your past guests are as well. Um, you know, uh, it's just having a go at different areas and, uh, and defining your strengths in each of those, really. For me, it's all about editing. Um, my films have definitely become very post-production heavy. So for me, it's all about what happens in the editing room. I think, um, don't get me wrong, I love shooting, but sometimes that gets a bit too stressful. And, you know, you you, you really do hope that, uh, you know, you can get light in a bottle and get what you need from the shoot. Whereas in the edit, if you don't, then you kind of find ways around that you know, and create some more magic. I, I, I got the opportunity to watch Pocket Book of Superstitions. And I have to say that the um, the thing that I, I, I didn't know much about your work. I know Lauren had sent me um, the Bell and the, the Witch. Witch Elm. Yep. Uh, but I loved the, the silent movie take kind of, uh, at least that's what I took from it. Like that kind of way that it was shot. Is that something you had in mind in the beginning of that movie? Oh yeah, I mean, I'm 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 obsessed with silent films. I mean, um, I I've watched, you know, I, I kind of grew up what what you know in the video shop days. So we'd go to the video shop and rent all the '80s horror films we could possibly find. Uh, so I guess you know your tastes just refine and find themselves in little, you know, going down these little routes. And for me now, silent silent cinema is just uh, the most distilled cinema ever will be, I guess, really, because it's all about that reliance on imagery and there's something so romantic and haunting about silent cinema. So I just wanted to capture some of that, really. But it's a bit of a, a you know, it's a bit of a, a twofer because um, not only do I find it very intoxicating and romantic and cinematic, it's also very good for economic filmmaking because you can, you know, really home in on what you want to show and, you know, um, and then cut out a lot of, details around it uh and you know just really just home in on what you want to show and kind of mask a load of the seams so you know if you're filming near a main road for instance but you want to focus in on this little area here you can do that you know yeah it came across great thank you cheers really enjoyed I mean, it. You know, there's loads of um what it is is that there's loads of uh kind of museums around uh darted around um well not just the midlands but all around the country really and Obviously, a lot of them are, you know, National Trust uh, sort of run and owned, uh, whereas it's, you've got loads where they're just like run by local councils or independently. So for me, that was like, um, you know, let's get in there and have a day of filming and see if we can get it for a bargain price. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's all your, your, your mise on scene and everything sorted for you, really. And so I guess because in a lot of these museums, you've got um, a lot of kind of museum paraphernalia so like signage and stuff like this so obviously the, the the challenge is to kind of film all around that and with it being a silent thing you can always cut to a little title card little vignette in, in you know just in case you, you you can't kind of match character moving from scene a to scene b so you can you know work your way around all these things by jumping into other you know um irrelevant little seemingly irrelevant little bits and bobs and details just to kind of mask the fact that maybe you can't get away with shooting something too fluid there you know interesting yeah i didn't i never would have thought of that that's great that's very cool did you Thank start you. oh did you start out with the idea and then as you were developing it found the locations you liked or did you have some locations you were like i'm desperate to film here and then the movie came second 
Yeah, a bit of both, really. Um, so uh, after kind of finishing my um, Acid Western, which we shot uh, around the Midlands and Wales, you know, we shot some of that in Wales. Um, you know, I was very kind of burnt out and I wanted to do a project which didn't involve, uh, well, so many actors, really. So I started with the idea of, of just doing something based on hands. And <laughs> and then obviously it grew to being probably my biggest cast I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's some locations in the film uh, which, you know, for instance, the the old Victoria Manor house um, for the haunted house sequence. That is a house that I used to go to as a child because it was a park that was local to most of my family and where we lived. Um, you could go into this house, you know, and they'd always do like ghost walks and Halloween kind of Halloween specials there where you kind of be told ghost stories and be shown all around the house and then you get told all the different ghost stories you know involving the house so I used to dream about the house I used to dream about being stuck in there with ghosts and and stuff like this so it was always on you know it was always definitely on the agenda to film in there one day so we we made sure we filmed in there whereas others uh yeah so um you read up on these different superstitions and you think okay so this needs a bedroom, that needs this, this needs that. Where can I find that? And then it is a case of looking for the location. So where where did all the superstitions come from? Like, did you have to do a whole bunch of research for this? Like, is, is there something that I'm not familiar with over here? Or where did the, the idea and where did the knowledge of everything come from? Um, yeah, so I've got two encyclopedias of superstitions. I'm not sure... If well, here's one of them. Um, this is a proper old one called uh, the uh, Encyclopedia of Superstitions. It's got okay. that beautiful, <laughs> beautiful cover art there. You know, it's a big wrap around, uh, and that's full to the brim of these strange esoteric uh, superstitions. And then I brought another one which was a little a bit broader because they'd include just things like ghosts and witches, and I guess that's a broad spectrum in itself. You know, so I just thought, well, let's do a mixture of. Um, you know, ones everybody knows, and then throw in a few which were kind of like a bit more, you know, a bit more kind of obscure, I guess. There was one in particular, the uh, the one about the baking of a dumb cake on the eve of, eve of St. Agnes. That was uh, supposedly a West Midlands, um, uh, West Midlands centric superstition. So I thought, well, I've got to put a bit of that in there because the West Midlands is where I am, you know. <laughs> so that made sense. And I thought, that, you know, the stranger the better, really. <laughs> awesome. It definitely has that. When well, you... You... Sorry, carry on. No, go ahead. What are you saying? I'm just saying it was just basically just a wealth of um, source material that yeah. enabled me to spring off of and, and create images for, you know, which is which is great for me, really. <laughs> <laughs> when you were trying to narrow it down, did you, like, bounce it off anybody? Or was it something that you just kind of knew instinctively which ones you wanted to do? Because that's a huge encyclopedia. That could have been, yeah. like, a 20-hour film. <laughs> It was a case of knowing when to stop. I mean, there were so many on the slate that we didn't do. And then there were bits that I actually started and then just kind of abandoned sort of thing. And I was even like kind of toying with the idea of losing a few from the, the finished film. But then what happens is you kind of have to work out how one segment's going to flow on to another. So usually that includes like a visual a signifier, really, to bring you into the next part. And... I just had to create some sort of flow. And if that felt disrupted in any way, then I'd have a problem and it'd just create more work, I guess. So I just had to <laughs> end up finishing what I had and then just hope that I didn't have to go on another tangent to get out of another kind of obstacle I'd, I'd thrown in front of myself. So it was um, uh, it was strange because I didn't really um, set out with any specific kind of structure in mind. I mean, I guess most of these books are alphabetic, you know, in alphabetical order and... But I didn't kind of approach it like that. It was more a case of uh, how you want to juggle the moods. And I suppose different superstitions brought different vibes. So it was, a, you know, it was, I, I was mainly doing it blind, really, <laughs> and hoping for the best. Uh, but I think we kind of ended up striking a sort of balance in the end, you know. But yeah, it's, uh, it's sorry, carry on, Chris. Oh no, I was I was actually gonna ask Lauren. I thought she if she didn't know she was gonna ask a question, but I kind of wanted to to ask if if you don't mind going backwards a little bit, what got you into horror movies? Like what was I know you said you rented everything, you know, you go and rent anything you could, but what was the one thing that kind of said, Man, I like this genre? 
I think it was initially just walking into the video shop, you know, and then seeing all these uh, painted um, covers because to me they look like cartoons. I mean, a lot of them did. I mean, you know, you'd walk in and I distinctly remember the likes of um, Graham Humphreys, you know, his artwork on Night of the Creeps. Night of the Creeps was a big rental for us back in the day. We rent that so many times. But, you know, the cover arts were painted and so colourful that they they looked so fun but there was this sort of forbidden element because they were all like rated 18. And I was like, well, why is something so colorful and fun looking? Not for me, <laughs> not, you know, why aren't I allowed to see this? But luckily our parents were very, you know, very good to us. They let us watch these films. I think they, they let us watch these films on the proviso that one of them would scare us so much that we wouldn't want to watch any more. And obviously <laughs> the, op the opposite effect happened that we just <laughs> wanted to keep renting them and buying yeah. them. So, yeah, I guess it was just that, um, I guess it was just the video shop, you know. And then, you know, I was watching Jaws by the age of three and Nightmare on Elm Street by the age of five. <laughs> wow. Don't cry, don't that that, that, those will leave marks. Those, both of those will leave marks in different ways. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Jaws, it's, yeah, Jaws was traumatic, you know. Um but yeah, we, I guess we just came out on the other side. We'd end up watching these films before bed and then we'd have sweet dreams, but then I'd watch a comedy before bed and I'd have nightmares. So. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's strange. Yeah. No, so, did, was yeah. there one film where you were just like, oh my gosh, I have to make films that did that for you? Um, I guess it was just every... I think it was just film in general because even back when we were walking into the... The video shop we were still we were picking up on the how these films are made and the, and the marketability of films from an early age because we'd end up looking at the back of the covers and if there wasn't any money shots on the back of the cover you know like special effects shots or anything we'd assume the film didn't have any and we'd put it back <laughs> because you know we were getting wise to the fact that some of these covers didn't really represent what was actually in these films you know and then we'd kind of fall into that whole trap of renting a film realizing it's a film we've already seen but with a different title stuff like this <laughs> so the marketability and how these films were made and marketed that, that started to kind of you know um we started to pick up on stuff like that and then we'd look at um the films themselves and then we'd start seeing the special effects and thinking well you know we we can we can have a go at this and i think what it all started with like basically using our cuddly toys they were like our first casts and action figures so i think before we even got a camcorder i was kind of doing this thing with my eye like <laughs> cutting <laughs> blinking and cutting and you know looking at toy one and then cuddly <laughs> toy two, and then and then then we got our hands on the family camcorder and then it was like our cuddly toys coming past the camera like this and then and then I think as we gradually went along, we thought, okay, how can we do that without showing some hands? Then so we would just start attaching strings to the the, the cuddly toy's arms <laughs> and then covering them in fake blood. And then from there on in, I don't know, it just, it just seemed like such an organic growth of like, you know, let's try this now, let's try this now, and then let's try a bit of stop motion, let's try a bit of this. And then it was like, right, okay, so now we need to start using human beings. <laughs> and then we'd start roping <laughs> our friends into it. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. By the time you're 12, everyone's just covered in blood and everybody's <laughs> coming to your house to be on camera. It's good. It's good stuff. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. I mean, we'd just black people to come home after school and then just be in our zombie films and stuff like that, you know? <laughs> Great. You mentioned that, you know, it's so true. You mentioned the, the back of the box cover. And I remember the video store that I used to go to and the horror movies were kind of around this corner and kind of in the back and and nightmare on elm street is my all-time favorite horror movie the first one the claw the the scene of johnny depp's basically blood going up on the wall and i kind of remember and maybe i've made this up but i kind of remember that the kind of the pan out of the bedroom and the blood coming up was one of the pictures on the back mm -hmm. um it kind of showing you different scenes from the movie and do you find that marketing your films, like, you know, people will watch, I go to the movies and you watch a movie, uh, the previews, you know, they have like 45 minutes of previews before the actual movie now. And you're like, nope, I've seen that movie. Now you feel like you've seen everything or are some movies you're like, what were they even trying to, to do there? Do you find that the marketing of the movie is almost like as tough as trying to tell the story 
in the movie itself? Yeah, it can be. Um, because I think, um, well, after kind of sussing out the, the general horror gist of things, you know, I mean, I started kind of getting further into the more esoteric stuff and more kind of, I guess, world cinema and avant-garde sort of things because I'm, you know, from from the horror sort of that gateway drug, isn't it? You know, you, you, you get into horror, then you get into cinema. That's how I got into cinema. I watched, you know, um, and it was always that kind of promise of something forbidden or something that you don't quite understand. And then I'd start looking at how these, you know, outsider films were sort of marketed. And I guess, um, yeah, I guess uh, how, in, in, in the terms of a genre trapping, yeah, very much so. If you wanted to make something a bit different, how would you market that, you know? Um, video labels over here, it was usually kind of like the art house labels or something that would kind of give you one image and they wouldn't have fun because it was far beyond them to have fun with cover art and stuff like this. <laughs> Um, but for from, from my own stuff, I don't know, I generally have a, a pretty strong, solid idea of how this film should look in terms of marketing materials as well as the film itself. Um, I think well, while we were making these films with our cuddly toys, I was drawing VHS covers with pens, uh, crayons and stuff like this before we knew what, uh, you know, Photoshop was and stuff like that. So. Oh, yeah. I've, the whole the whole process, the films, and then the marketing of said films was was stra you know that was something we were just so drinking up from such early age. So yeah, it's, I, I generally do have a, a very strong grasp on how I like to market the films that I make because I just think that's all part and parcel of how a film should be represented. So I don't know, it's just, it's a tough one. It can be tricky though because in this day and age, um, especially on the indie circuit, you know people love horror comedies they love horror they you know they love stuff they can put in a bracket more so whereas if you're making something a bit different um there's not really any kind of distributors out there that would cater for that i don't think at my level so you know it, it is tough if you want to play the game that way yeah have you found that it's been uh, harder sort of trying to get distributors behind the film than actual fans um i think uh with well, with Pocket Film, I haven't really tried because I think with Bella, I made an executive decision to just distribute it myself because the film itself was like 36 minutes, which is a very awkward run time because that's too long for a short film for most film festivals and it's too short for a feature. <laughs> so the best thing to do is just market it yourself, you know. And I did very well out of selling uh, my own copies of that film. You know, we, we got through maybe 500 um Wow. DVDs and Blu-rays, yeah, yeah, it was, it, it did really well. And with superstitions, I guess it's going to be the same sort of deal, really. We're going to keep it close, not let it go to anyone. I let um, Day of the Stranger go to a Canadian distributor, and you know, I generally kept an eye on what's been happening with that. And for the most part, it's nothing I couldn't have done myself. So yeah, I mean, people learn the hard way by giving these films away to a lot of huckster distributors. <laughs> Especially in the indie game, because again, if you want to kind of argue the toss and try and fight to get your film back, generally you're not going to kind of, you know, build a case and and you know be able to play it out and win. So they end up just running away with loads of content, you know. Um, so it's full of prit balls and and whatnot. But you know, you learn, you learn these things. So it definitely sounds, you know, like the <laughs> after. It, the making it and the creative process of, of telling the story and, and put, putting it all together can definitely, it's its better to keep it in hand, huh? And just then letting someone else take away your your work and your content. Well, yeah, because each film I make, I mean, they end up getting, they don't get any cheaper either. I mean, I mean, Pocket Film is a very modest, modest budgeted film. I think it cost around five and a half or six grand all in all. Mm -hmm. And that was just kind of money trickling in when whenever I could get it. But it's still a case of, well, that's six grand spent on this now. So don't just give it away, you know. Right. And there's a and a lot of these distributors, they're taking on films now that cost upward of 30, 50, 100 grand. But they're, they're taking on films that cost 100 grand. And then they're taking on a film that cost a grand. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> you know, so obviously the film that cost a grand that's got more chance of making the money back but then these films that cost 100 grand where's it where's it gonna where's it you know how are you gonna reap that back you know right but i'm also sorry carry on line no 
go ahead, Tom. I was going to say I'm also of the opinion that sometimes you you know art costs money, so you don't necessarily make a film to make money back because it's like well, you know uh, you can you can spend a lot of money on getting your house decorated or you know get a new car or something, or you can make a film. <laughs> <laughs> From the little bit that I've been learning about indie film while I've been in it for the past year or so, I've discovered that like film festivals is also a very big part of it, not even necessarily as much as distribution. Have you found that's been true for your films? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But then, um, again, I, I still make films that are quite, um, I suppose, low budget, really. I mean, that uh, seems like an obvious thing to say in the indie scene, but there are some beautifully polished films out there, and I guess... Uh, my film doesn't kind. Of, my films, especially this new one, it they don't really kind of subscribe to what, I guess what's a given for these sort of um, polished remit of films that you can get now. Uh, so certain films won't give it time of day. So film festivals won't give it time of day, whereas others will embrace it for what it is. And there's an audience for every film, I guess. So everyone just needs to kind of keep going and find their festivals, find their audiences, because. No matter what level you're going to be at, you're going to get rejections and you're going to get, you know, your film accepted at places. So it's just playing that game, isn't it? And just not getting disheartened by it. But the film festival scene is huge. Um, it's not exactly the whole of the, you know, makeup of the horror scene, but it's a very big part of it, you know. And um, I think a lot of what I see on the scene uh, does tend to kind of follow, uh, fall into patterns. So... I suppose I do consciously try and disrupt that a little bit with offering something a bit different, maybe. So, <laughs> yeah. So that's so when you go to these different festivals, I mean, so do you know kind of ahead of time what their genre? Is? I mean, yes, it's horror, but like, do you know kind of what they're looking for in that? You know, each one, or is it you? Is it brand new each time? I just I have no I know nothing about the festival scene. Um. It's hard to say, really, uh, and sometimes you can kind of, it, it, it sort of becomes a bit of a political kind of uh, subject to get into. Um, but I guess if a film comes with its buzz, with a buzz, uh, that would guarantee bums on seats, then um, that film's in. And I, I guess that, I guess the quality of that film is secondary to the fact that it's got a buzz around it and can bring okay. people in. Do you know what I mean? So Yeah. There's a lot of that going on, but then, you know, there's a lot of films that are deservedly getting the the plaudits that they deserve, and, you know, I don't know, it's a tricky one to get into, that one. <laughs> Sorry, didn't, 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 well, not, not trying, I, no, I'm no, just no. more curious about, I, I've heard with Lauren, you know, like, now venturing into it, I, I'm definitely learning more about it. It's a world that I really didn't even know existed, and so yeah. it's, it's very interesting to me. There's a lot of facets to it, I mean... You know, it, it's one of these things where you got to juggle a, a business acumen and an integrity which rests on your taste and what you generally think of these films. So if you can juggle those <laughs> and uh, maintain a, an integrity whilst running a festival, a successful festival, then, then you know, you can't keep everyone happy either. So <laughs> it's one of those things. Gotcha. It is. Yeah. It, I don't. I don't envy anyone who have who has to kind of go through all these submissions and then kind of break the news to people who haven't got in. And then you know it, it's. But they they do these festivals for a reason, and people have got to turn up to these festivals. So it is a business in itself, you know. But then, as a as a as a film fan, I just found I was seeing a lot more and more of the same sort of thing, you know. And a lot, a lot of people on the scene, or in the game, or at this level, I should say, really, um, you find that they try and remake, you know, um, low budget versions of films they've seen made with bigger, bigger budgets and films that, are, so they're just trying to kind of make carbon copies in a way. And you know, and that's not, that's not what I think indie's all about, personally. Right. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. It's great that you can find something really genuinely different in indie films. Also, I think I think that's why quite a lot of us watch and love indie films. Is that is that part of what you love about doing indie films? How sort of risk taking you can be? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, just present, just express yourself uh, freely without being told you can't do this and you shouldn't be, you know, without the without the thought that you've got to fit into any sort of pigeonhole because 
that's not what it's about at all. You fought, it'll find its audience regardless, you know. I mean, I, mean, I, I suppose a lot of the people, uh, a few people want to try and break into the industry or think they're going to break into the industry by, you know, taking the, the do, doing the things they do, making the films they do. But for me, it's just about pure expression. You know, it's all about expressing an idea and seeing that there's a gap in the landscape that you think, well, no, no one's done a film like this or no one's done a film like this in 100 years, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's put a bit more of that into the scene again sort of thing again going back to the silent era stuff it's like well yeah i'm not the only filmmaker riffing on silent uh vibes uh in modern day filmmaking but i just think well you know it's nice to inject a bit more of that into the current scene because you know with an emphasis on the quaint and the spooky rather than going for the same sort of i don't know same sort of modernist sort of approaches i guess um so yeah you know it, it, it's 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 all about expression for me and and it's also important that uh filmmakers watch films you know um because i you know he's, uh, something that does come up time and time again is it's, it's apparent that you watch these films and the filmmakers themselves don't seem to have watched that many films and i think that would benefit them greatly uh, if they watch films because then they'd know they'll have a broader vocabulary of what's out there whereas i like to think i've got a, quite a, an expansive knowledge on films to think well you know there's not enough of this out there there's not enough of that out there so let's explore these areas sort of thing you know that's so cool do you i gotta off the, if it's okay chris off the back of that do you have you had some things that you've watched recently that made you go aha like this is something new or interesting or different you hoped more people had watched uh in, in recent you can't yes i must have done but my brain is so oh, <laughs> terrible sorry. at remembering <laughs> um i think in terms of like uh, current mainstream sort of films i love the menu because ah, yeah. because um when i watched that it reminded me of um how the czechs used to make films in the late 60s early 70s or throughout the the czech new wave because they were very biting satires you know with kind of play when they were very playful with the form as well and they were just very kind of pessimistic and it reminded me of a czech film so i really enjoyed that because it kind of brought these that sort of biting pessimistic satire into a kind of a more mainstream kind of you know or, what would you recommend or, as a, a czech film i i that's interesting that you said that so what was what is one that you that you like that you would recommend people to watch um, I recommend anything by Jan Zwankmeyer, who made um, a film called Alice. He did his own version of Faust, which was incredible. He was a stop motion artist whose films are very nightmarish because of his stop motion style. He usually uses loads of taxidermy and stuff like this. Um, but his Faust is just incredible. Right? And his Alice in Wonderland is incredible. So check those two out. Check okay. those two out. <laughs> and... <laughs> There was uh, also films such as like The Cremator. I recommend a film called The Cremator and a film called Valerie and Her Weaker Wonders as well. The very dreamlike film about a girl who, you know, starts to come of age, so to speak. So, um, yeah, I, I really recommend diving into Czech New Wave because nobody does kind of dark, by like pessimistic satire, but also dark fairy tale okay. um, stuff as, as good as the uh, Czechs. So I, I really recommend diving in. Yeah, I'm always up for, for a new genre, new just new movies in general. And I apologize. I it's kind of a written rule now, um, routine that I will have dog um interruptions in the middle of this. So I <laughs> push through the door on one side and they're going out the other <laughs> side and trying to close the door. One comes in the other door. So I apologize. I did not no, mean not to at all. It's nice just... to have uh, fairy friends uh, jumping in there <laughs> and again. I mean, I'll shut my office door so the cats can't start swimming around my legs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lauren knows at this point one of the two is going to make a. a they're 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 just camera hogs. They just they want to be they want to be known. They want to be loved. <laughs> so. Yeah. But awesome. no, that's great. The Czech movies that that's very interesting because uh, I I definitely like to know um or find something i haven't seen before right I mean, oh yeah it's, not... it's also well i'm going to be stealing from definitely i mean when i make my next films and there's so many bits from czech films that i'm like i'm i'm stealing that i'm stealing that i'm stealing that 
<laughs> what what are you thinking of next? What 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 is your next kind of your brain kind of going to? Well, um um so I'm very much sticking to the same sort of um vibes, you know. I'm, I want to keep things dreamy, keep things quite beautiful and quaint and but I want to kind of broaden the dynamic a little bit now, you know, kind of up the ante so to speak. So whether that means following an actual protagonist, you know, go through a So the thing is, I want to kind of tell you some ideas, but what usually happens is I'll tell you that, then I'll go and make something completely different. <laughs> nope, that's, that's fair enough. Fair enough. I've been cooking up about, uh, yeah, I've been cooking up two or three um, okay. different ideas, and one of them's like more serious. The other one's a lot more playful, much like Pocket Film. But it's still, I, whatever happens, they're going to complement each other really, because I think the kind of lo fi aesthetics of pocket film will kind of i guess will be enjoyed a bit broad more broadly if this other film works i guess so i guess people will start to you know find a relationship between them because you know bella and the witch Elm sort of came from the same world as pocket film but that was made with like you know five pounds in the pickled onion whereas <laughs> Bella's pocket film was made for 10 pounds in a jar of pickled onions you know <laughs> I think that's the new it. indie scale, is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I want to up the ante a little bit, you know, for the next one. So maybe a twenty pound note and a jar of pickled eggs this time. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't tell they need to do ratings for movies now. We give this four pickled jars of eggs. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of eggs. <laughs> that's a great film, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great film, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've talked a lot about you behind the camera, but I always love watching you in front of the camera. You get to see a little bit of it in pocket film. And it, what do you enjoy acting? Is it just something that happens because you need the actors or do you quite like it? Yeah, I, I do. I really enjoy it. Um, in fact, I guess it was uh, my first love really at, at school and stuff like this. So I did like school plays and try and, you know, uh, audition for like local, um, you know, amateur dramatics and stuff like as a kid. But then I guess when we started getting more and more into the camcorder, I just started disappearing. And a lot of the early stuff, even while in times of pocket film, it was just out of necessity, really, just because it was like relying on one less person. Um, but when any, when anybody asks me to be in their films, I jump at the chance because it's like a busman's holiday. You know, I get to enjoy the uh, film set without having to stress about anything other than just what I've got to do, just my lines and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, and I love the idea of um I guess I just put myself in the bracket of character actor, so I like to play a lot of the the grotesques and the strange. So you know, if I can try and transform myself in the slightest possible way, just to do little little turn as a kind of grotesque, then I'm happy. <laughs> and you know, what part is... of this local scene as well. Of, of you know, I say local scene, part of the UK indie scene, I should say. Um, you know, you you will find a cross pollination where you know we are acting in each other's films and vice versa and, and stuff like this there's a scene at the end of um pocket film the shrinks office so each each person on that shoot were filmmakers themselves film directors so for me it was just it was much easier to ask another filmmaker to come and be in my scene than ask an actor because i guess an actor has their own prerequisites or idea of how a shoot should go whereas filmmakers other filmmakers they're just not going to give you any grief whatsoever so you know you just get them to rock up and then they understand what has to be done <laughs> that's clever <laughs> mm. makes, yeah. makes it easier for you for sure absolutely yeah yeah so yeah and andy uh, elias who joined us on that day he kind of subsequently cast me in tales from the great war so again we're just doing each other favors really <laughs> that's, that's awesome. how it gets that's how things get done so yeah what's what's a good day on a set i mean what you're 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 into kind of you know you're you're doing it all and i know you like doing the you said you like it in front of the camera but is there is there a specific shoot that you were on that you were just like man that if i could replicate that every day that would be like what what does a good day on a set look like for you um it's funny because you sort of go into a little trance really because then you're, you're kind of operating on a sort of strange autopilot where you just because me i've got it all kind of 
I've got it all mapped out in my head how things get cut and, and shot. So I'm just like, right, we need that. And then before you know it, it's over. And you're like, wow, we survived. We survived. You know, um, I guess. I guess the uh, the scene where um, the scene in pocket film with the changeling. So the baby. Um, again, so we, the actress in that um Imogen Archer, bless her. She we didn't know her from Adam, so she turned up, and the rest of us were friends. And, and so obviously you always get these kind of, you know, these these, these butterflies thinking, oh my god, what they're going to think of us, and and that was such a dream because, um, the scene in in the scene was again this was a museum nearby where they uproot old buildings and then put them all on this bit of land. So you have this medieval merchant's house which is what we filmed in for th that scene but then you've got like a 1950s house next to it and then you've got like a, a strange corrugated church next to that so it's just all these different buildings uprooted but the the museum were kind enough to let us just pay admission and then go and film in there and but then they had all these spotlights just on the in the ceiling which created the most beautiful lighting that none of us had to set up so everything was just handed to us on a plate and it went so smoothly that it just kind of thought, wow, if if, if every shoot's going to be like this, then we're going to be fine. And obviously every shoot wasn't like that at all because <laughs> it never is, is it? But, but I guess it's when, it's when um, what my friend Steve calls the celluloid god, when the celluloid god looks down on you and gives you the gifts that you need to get your shoot, get you through the shoot or whatever, because the amount of times something will come up, someone will let you down or or a location will fall through. The celluloid god usually, uh, you know, picks you back up and uh, and gives you another gift that, uh, you know, will make you do a U-turn and do something completely different, or and then it will work out better even. So right, it's just going up against the cosmic forces, really. <laughs> gives you just enough to be like, I want to do this again. <laughs> and then, yeah. and then you get into it. Yeah. Whereas not before, it's always the jitters and you, you know, the anxiety and the stress is just, you know, it's you. It's so strong that you just wonder to yourself, why do I do this to myself? This is just torture. And then, you know, 24 hours later, you're like, oh, I'm so glad we did that. <laughs> <laughs> you were saying earlier how much of your films come together in post-production. Do you have any of those feelings of like ups and downs and celluloid gods in post-production? Or is that more like I have this and I'm in control? Absolutely, yeah, because... Uh... I guess what happens is you, you kind of screw up a shoot or something happens and you just have to learn to edit your way around anything and everything. And I think with Pocket Film, the fact that it took so long uh, to finish was beneficial because it enabled me to keep looking at the same sort of scenes over and over again and reinventing them and adding all these different dimensions and elements to them that I maybe wouldn't have done if I kind of um, shot and edited in a very quick, succession of time so yeah it they presented their own um gems for us uh, i'm trying to think of a good example really i think maybe the the scene where we have the um the dead body lying on the bed with the coins on her eyes i was just inspired because i weren't so, too happy with my camera work that day because sometimes i you know i really muck up the camera work <laughs> that's that's one of my uh one of my Achilles heels is I'm not very techn technologically adept at the cameras. I like I know how to point a camera, just sometimes the camera just oh, it's a bit too um, complicated for me. So I wasn't too happy with the footage, and so therefore it was a case of like, okay, how do I make this look good? You know, so then you have to run through every possible option in in your mind before taking a step back and thinking, hang on a minute, I'm thinking too literal here. Let's take it. Let's put something else in. That's um, you know, so I. Uh, um, it was a quote from Tennyson, um, a Tennyson poem. So I just thought, right, okay, put a bit of that on on screen with a pan. So that's one way to move the scene along without having to move the scene along, sort of thing. You know, just just things like this. It's just a case of you've afforded yourself the time to ponder, and then you know it'll just come to you. <laughs> no, that's great. That's what. It's funny that you, I, I, I'm kind of drawn back to what you were saying about the lighting and the, the spotlights and it kind of created what you wanted, right? And you didn't have to mess with that. Is there, 
a location, if you could shoot anywhere, make a movie anywhere, what what location would that be? Oh. Like dream location, no funds aren't an issue. You could just you were able to use it. Basically, my, most gothic castles and gothic mansions, I think, because I'm just all about the gothic, really. I mean, okay. if I can, if I can get into a gothic castle, then I'm sorted. That, that's me done. I want gothic corridors with the, the, you know, with the wind hitting the curtains and the curtains. I want okay. someone walking through it with a candelabra, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, if I can get anything like that, I'll be happy. So that, that's <laughs> that's on the list. Gotcha. <laughs> there's, okay. plenty, there's plenty of options in the UK. It's just kind of getting in there, really, and then. Obviously, what happens is, you you know, I mean, the reason I, I, I got away with so much on pocket film is that sometimes you've only got like a handful of hours at these locations. So if you're not filming sound or if you're not filming a sort of linear narrative, you're just getting shot, 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 shot. Then you can just get in and out. You know, I mean, like, for instance, um, the scene with the witch finder and the vampire scene, which both had Danny Thompson in. That, that was the same location because it was the location where my wife and I got married <laughs> the, the following oh, year. Um, it was like a again a Tudor a Tudor building which was uprooted and owned by the Cadbury Company, and so we were told when we got there we had a wake at two o'clock and I was like a wake, um, so we had like four hours to do two scenes so that gave us two hours each to get these scenes done which was which was good going but I would have loved to have just had that for two days you know and but yeah any any gothic building castle that is my jam you know <laughs> no we'll get it we'll get it <laughs> <laughs> all right then do you have a gothic film that you really love and would like to recommend to people because i love the gothic as well i mean i love the innocence uh oh, yeah. that's one of my favorite films i mean you know the turn of the turn of the screw is it, it, it's the best iteration of that story and it's just the most beautiful, beautiful film. Freddie Francis's cinematography is just, ah, oh, I love it. And that is your classic Gothic mansion, you know, long corridors, De Deborah Kerr. It, what a film, what a film. I love The Innocence. So yeah, I really recommend The Innocence to anyone who hasn't seen it. I have not. So now I have another movie to add to my list. Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, um, I'm kind of, one of those one of the very few who do not i'm not such a fan of the haunting i never really found it scary or anything for me that early 60s uh um haunted house film for me is the innocence so it's, okay that is the film for me is the innocence great film no chris i think you'll love it especially the 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 end i think the end scene is one of the most beautiful things i've ever seen i don't know tom if you have another one that pops to mind but oh and scene is incredible. Okay. Absolutely. And it's so it's so eerie and it's just so well played. And again, going back to Freddie Francis's for cinematography and Jack Clayton's direction. I mean Jack Clayton's a great director. He went on to direct a film called Something Wicked This Way Comes, which was a Ray Bradbury story which he made for Disney, which was the, the dark Disney era, you know, when they were making films like Return to Oz and <laughs> That was a really good, that's another good film from the same director, uh, but The Innocence, yeah, check check it out. I will definitely do that. What speaking of movies to recommend, let's just I want to ask this question. I like to ask anybody that is on this question. We all have friends, and well, Lauren and I both have friends that do not watch horror movies. They're they're they don't want to be scared. They don't want to watch. But we realize that like a lot of times it's. I don't like slasher movies or I don't like this. So if you were trying to give someone a movie to start off in horror, just to see if they might like it, they don't know if they like it or not. What what would be your movie, your kind of starter horror movie? Um, I think possibly just from um, maybe experience with people in my family, um, maybe go, like a, a good ghost story maybe because um, – I don't know. That seems to have a broader appeal, I think, than uh, for people than people like, than just recommending something that's outright horror, I guess. So for me, I guess the old ghost story for Christmas films, which the BBC made, um, which is funny because Kidderminster was actually one of the filming locations for The Signalman, uh, the Charles Dickens one with Denon Elliott. It's a great <laughs> one. In, well, in fact, you know the shot in pocket film of uh, superstitions when the train comes towards the camera 
and the the steam just fills the screen. Well, that 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 tunnel and that stretch of railroad is the tunnel and the railroad from the, the signalman. Yeah, so cool. that's why it's in the film. <laughs> so cool. Yeah, so that was that was shot here in Kidderminster. That one. Um, that's a great one. So yeah, I recommend that the signalman and um, and the warning to the curious because I guess it crosses that kind of the vein of TV drama to outright horror. I guess. Uh, <laughs> And a lot of people love ghost stories, but don't particularly like horror films, because um, I think there's something so personal about, you know, attaching yourself to a ghost story because everyone's got their own experiences or or it taps into their own personal fears. So I guess a ghost story, I guess like something ghostly, you okay. know. Uh, this will come out on Halloween, this particular episode. So what would be a really good movie to watch on Halloween? What's one that you would love to watch on mm. Halloween? Again, I'm gonna um I'm gonna be that difficult one and and it's not a particular it's not a film, but it's the first episode of Tales from the Dark Side that George Romero directed. It's called Trick or Treat. And it's so good. It's just such a great half hour. Yeah. It it's about it's about this elderly miser who's like, you know, he 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 basically he's got everyone in his pocket, so you know, everyone's all in debt. So he's just got he hoards all his wealth at this house. But he um he does this thing on Halloween where he sets his house up into a kind of haunted house full of spooks and 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 surprises, and he um he gets one of the kids to one of the families to go through the house, and if the kid can go through the house without running away screaming, then he'll kind of clear the debt sort of thing. But because it's Halloween, you know the veil has been lifted, and uh, there's some real spooks about, and he might just get his comeuppance sort of thing, you know. <laughs> But that is just a central Halloween viewing. Absolutely great, that is. And maybe um, a film that I always recommend is uh, Session Nine. Oh, I mean, so good. Yeah, that's yeah. one of my favourite films. I think that's a film that should be watched every Halloween because it generally does get under your skin. <laughs> it was, it was, I was not expecting it. It was one of those, I think when COVID hit, and everybody was kind of, you know, shut down and you're not going out. I I think I I just started going through movies I hadn't seen. And I was like, I'm going to start watching horror movies. And that was one of them on there that I was like, wow, how did I not see this before? And it gets better with each viewing as well. Um, Like, it doesn't lose its power, basically. It genuinely is like the shining for the post-millennium age. It's just great film. Yeah, and they shot that in an actual asylum as well. You know, that was apparently like the the shots of the wheelchairs and stuff. They didn't have to put that there. That was just there. You know. Oh, cool. Yeah. So they were someone filming. has a sense of humor to close down to abandon a psychiatric hospital or a ward and just leave old wheelchairs there. Like, <laughs> who's doing that? <laughs> it's, a it's a filmmaker's dream. That is, you know. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. We never thought of that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so one of the things we do as well on this is every month we watch a new movie that has at least part of it filmed in London. And our next one is going to be, uh, and so you mentioned The Shining, so obviously it's a Stanley Kubrick. It's Clockwork Orange. Uh-huh. Do you have anything to tell to our listeners if they haven't seen it before? Watch it, don't watch it. Do you have any like interesting things you like to say about it? Um, I, I, it went, I went through a phase where I'd watch it every day sort of thing. There's, there, there were like very few films that I'd watch. Every, I think Eraserhead was one of them. I'd watch Eraserhead every day. Um, uh, because again, I think as a, as, as a film, it's, it's such a stark film of two halves. So the first half is the iconic half that everyone knows. And, you know, the imagery is kind of extracted from there. the second half. is a completely different kettle of fish. And it's just so funny how, for me, you see all these kind of old faces from British comedy TV just pop up in something so kind of risque. <laughs> <laughs> but I think for for what's supposedly he's one of his, you know, it's a futurist film, I guess, you know. Um, but it's uh, it's probably one of his most dated looking films just because it's so kind of high on such a sort of strange fashion, um, futurist fa- futurist fashion, you know, like the fact that his mum's got kind of. Um, purple hair and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I used to watch that film non-stop, you know. Oh, wow. 
I think, let me find, I've got a cracking VHS of a, a, a Spanish film that was made to cash in on A Clockwork Orange. Here it is. Check this out for a rip-off sleeve. Let me just... Uh, here. here we go. Uh, this is called A Clockwork Terror. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no! That is so funny. Yeah. It's actually a really good film called Murder in a Blue World. But obviously this goes after Clockwork Orange comes. Clockwork <laughs> Terror. And there's actually a scene at the end where they have Clockwork Orange on the TV, so... <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but it's got Sue oh, Lyon yeah. from uh, Lolita. It's got Dave, Chris Mitchum, David no Mitchum's talentless son. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it's a, it's a really good Spanish uh, film. The filmmaker's a really good Spanish filmmaker called Eloy de, de la Iglesia. But I really recommend that as well. But okay. it's... <laughs> No clockwork orange. <laughs> <laughs> so, is that enough clockwork orange riffing? <laughs> that is very impressive. I think you might have some of the few original comments ever made about clockwork orange. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I just used to watch that non stop, I guess, because you know, some films you just have to keep soaking up because it's just like there's so, so, so much on that tapestry to take in as a film, you know, someone who studies films or someone who just absorbs film. And Stanley Kubrick's a constant source of uh, fascination for me as well. So. Yeah. I think he is for a lot of people. I, I am not as big on to, in, to the back, you know, of the movies, of like who's making them and the directors and writers um, as I have been, as I've gotten older. But yeah, he is, he's divisive for sure. And like what he makes, you know, you're watching Stanley Kubrick for sure. I mean, it, my, my favorite other than 2001, <clears throat> is Eyes Wide Shut, because, you know, I never yeah. thought I'd ever have a favourite film with Tom Cruise in it, because I'm not such a fan, but Eyes Wide Shut is just masterful. It's just a masterpiece, you know. I just can't get over how we recreated the streets of New York in, you know, in the UK, really. It's just, it's crazy. But what a film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, very mind blowing. I don't think I expected it to be what it was. I didn't realize it was based on a story, so I hadn't read the book first. And it was very unusual, I think. It's, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because I think there was scandal when it originally came out, because obviously Kubrick died uh, just before it really came out. And there were just loads of reviews panning it, saying he was a dirty old man and stuff like this. And it was like, well, have you watched the same film? You know? <laughs> 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 you know, that masked ball scene, I guess, it just caught it all the attention. But um, what a film! Great, great film. Yeah. So yeah. So what? What are you guys watching on Halloween? Oh, I'm gonna bounce go it back and <laughs> turn it around. <laughs> yeah, you want to go first? Oh dear. Okay. Um. So so uh, this is contextual. So um, on Halloween, I'm doing a chili cook-off with my partner Tony, uh, and it's we're we're doing that as our like sort of thing for the Halloween day so because of that we're watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 oh, because yeah, it's got the chili, chili cook-off cook scene yeah, yeah. <laughs> what so a we're great film for punishment <laughs> I think that works I don't I should have went first is what I'm thinking at this point <laughs> Go on, we do the same watch? thing here every year so my son is into loves Mike Myers um and so, or I'm sorry, Michael Meyer. I, I will get this wrong. Michael Myers. Um, but we will watch Halloween. I mean, just and I and we'll probably watch the original Halloween and then stay up a little bit later now that they're getting older. And then I think he is the 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 final three that they made with Jamie Lee Curtis coming back and 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 he, he likes those as well. So we'll pick one of those and, and watch that. Oh, that's awesome. So your kids into horror, that's awesome. Yeah, he wasn't for the longest time, but I, he got, you know, he got into Mike, you know, Myers and the Halloween stuff. So we have a house that's down the road from us. And and so I live in a, a fairly new neighborhood, but we're in an older town and there's an old house that was probably built know, 1900, 1910 ish. And it looks like the, the Myers house. Wow. wow. And so, and that's where he, when he does his runs, and you have to run by it, and he's like, 
The, the house is so creepy. So wow. yeah. So I, and I'm sure it's a lovely house. It's much bigger than that house. It's not in Pasadena. So I'm, you know, it's, I I get it. But yeah, it it looks creepy enough. I'm just happy that they've kept it the same because in amongst suburban sprawl of every house being one of three models, you have this house with the bushes and like the creepy windows. So <laughs> that's yeah. beautiful. Wow. That's quite cute. I remember yeah, when it'll I was, be Halloween. Halloween will be on Hall. We'll watch that on Halloween. I think John Carpenter was one of the only directors who kind of, um, you know, scared me uh, with his films because I was so hardened to these horror films at such a young age. But Halloween, I think it's the stark contrast between something so white in the in the black. You know, it's like his face, especially when he's on the phone and he, his face comes real close to the camera pretty much for the first time. You mm. get to see his face in full clarity. That made me just like this, you know, because it was too much. And it was a yeah. bit similar to um, uh, similar to the white ghostly face you see in The Signalman. Really. It's just that kind of, it's how much that stark white hits you. It's a strange thing. But Michael Myers' face in that first film, it's just, ah, you know, it, it generally did freak me out. I think it's well that's a great job. Yeah, I think as well for me, part of the thing was it was it it is a, it's a face it's a mask that's a face, but it's like it's like a face and it's just that little bit not like a face, just yeah, enough uncanny, to be upsetting. That uncanny otherness, you know, that's I think that's what it does play there, isn't it? Which is so freaky, and the eye holes are just kind of vacuous. There's just nothing in there. Ooh. Yeah, the eye hole eye holes in any of those masks are always what makes the what makes it for me because it's just. It's just dead in there, right? Like you're yeah, not yeah. seeing any life in there. I think poor, poor William Shatner. Like Who knew? It was, it was yeah, Shatner. Yeah, so, yeah. Strange. <laughs> so strange. <laughs> but the scariest thing about that film is when they, he looks at the end and he's gone. And then if there was never any sequels after that, it'd be the perfect ending because it was all about the fact that it's just he's just evil. He's just he's just a concept, the evil as a yeah. as a kind of energy. But then they just had to kind of ring it out, didn't they? You know, and sort of thing. But I mean, I got caught up in that wave. I wanted to see more Michael Myers as a kid. I remember going to that video shop I was telling you about, and the first thing I saw was Halloween Three on the shelf. I was like, "What? We're getting this one. We're getting this one." And oh, then, so disappointing! Yeah, imagine my surprise. And I'll, what? Where? Where is he? You know. I mean, that's grown to be one of my favorite films now. I mean, I love it. But at the time, I was so cheated. <laughs> Yeah. We no, just we just dealt with that like three weeks ago. <laughs> we 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 had not seen that. We you know, and I was like, you know what? Let's just go get Halloween two and Halloween three. We'll just buy them on Voodoo. We're gonna watch them right. And we're sitting there. We're wa we watched Halloween two, and then we had to go do our stuff during the day. And we came back, and my son sits down. And we watch it. My wife falls asleep, and she's like, "This is dumb. Can we turn it off?" I'm like, "No." Like it's we're waiting for Mike Myers. And he watched the whole thing. And I know in his mind, he's waiting for my... So he's going to come out at some point. No, it's just masks. It's I, just, no. But as a standalone movie, I I thought it was great. But like you can't call it Halloween 3. No. Well, imagine if they went through their original plans. The original plan was to make it a sort of portmanteau series. So each film would have been a different story. And imagine right. if that happened. That would have been so strange. But, you know... Um, Nigel Neal, he originally wrote Halloween 3. Um, what a great name to have attached to a film, you know. I mean, that film is that sort of, you know, sort of thing Nigel Neal likes to balance, I guess, is that kind of the supernatural with science. So mm -hmm. I guess they had that Stonehenge, part of Stonehenge, trapped in this toy factory, which... How in the hell they got that there, I don't know. But <laughs> I love that they throw that away with a line. The guy says something like, you don't want to know how we got it here. And you're like, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Just write it off that way. That is so, that is right. so cheeky. <laughs> what, what do you think of sequels in general? Um, it depends. I mean, um, some of them you enjoy because they're so bad. Others, you just wonder why they made them at all. I mean, I, I wrote an article for We Belong Dead on rogue sequels. So I guess that's the sequels that just go completely the other way. And Halloween 3 is a great example of that. You know, and then you got films like Troll 2, which were like films hijacked by uh, Italians. So the Italians would move in and make their own sequels that nobody asked for sort of thing. So sequels are a very fascinating, you know, very fascinating phenomenon in themselves. I mean, the earliest 
some of the earliest Rogue sequels. There's a there's a silent film called The Golem. I don't know if you've ever seen The Golem. Well, that was actually the third of three Golem films. So the first one was Lost. And then the second one was a strange one called, what was it called there? Something like The Golem and the... Something like The Golem and the Girl or something like that. Where basically it's a sort of meta sequel where the guy who played the Golem and made the Golem puts on the Golem costume and goes to a fancy dress party to scare this girl. So hmm. it's like a 15 minute little vignette piece, so, but it makes no sense. But that's lost as well. But that was one of the strangest sequels ever made at that point, you know. So they are fascinating, but they're not always necessary. <laughs> Do you have any yeah. of your films that you think, I could have a sequel of that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I could... I guess I could, like, you know, do the second pocket film. (laughs) (laughs) More superstitions, you know. (laughs) Because the narrator at the end says, oh, you know, we couldn't quite fit them all into this little moving picture presentation. We'd be here rather a long time. So I guess I could just do more of the same of that, but I won't. (laughs) (laughs) I always like the idea of making a sequel for someone else's film because it's like, how, how do you take their ideas and apply them to your own thing, you know? So... If someone said to me, would you like to make a sequel to this? I'd be like, oh, maybe, you know, it'd be, it'd be interesting. Yeah, that's it. I mean, that's an interesting thought right there for sure is like, mm-hmm. can you get, I know Lauren and I have kind of talked about this with like just telling stories. Like I've always thought it'd be an interesting thing to give eight authors an idea and say, I want this story to go and you're going to have, I don't know if, if you think about it like Harry Potter, you have year one year two year three if you could break it up that way and be like you tell the story however you want and then put it together just to see how it will work linear linear, whatever that word is it will work as a as a line and telling the story but you get so many different thoughts yeah absolutely yeah i think um and sometimes you know uh sequels are there to improve on the first say i think the original prom night was quite a dire film to be honest with you then prom night two came along and that was everything that you wanted from a sort of eight is supernatural slasher thing mm-hmm. so sometimes they are there to improve on the i mean for a while i absolutely adored texas chainsaw massacre 2 because i found it even though it was a more like, overt in its kind of humor and black humor i found that more perverse really and and as a result quite disturbing and it's it's still its very own it's it's its own thing isn't it and it doesn't really detract from the original but it's almost like a spoof of the original but bringing it into the 80s because you know even the cook from the first one is now kind of wearing his polyester suit and he's kind of falling into that kind of 80s yuppiedom where he's making a name for himself and sort of (laughs) (laughs) so i guess you know they are sequels are fascinating it just depends what you do with them i guess you know totally now i know we, we've taken a lot of your days so yeah. far so we don't we don't want to take you too long forever it's been so much fun to talk to you but one of the things we want to make sure we did before you go is i know a pocket film is going to be in several festivals we didn't know if you wanted a chance to let people know where they might be able to see it if they're in the area okay well as it's going out on halloween it, it would have already played the festival of fantastic films in manchester which as of speaking is next weekend this this next weekend coming so that'll be playing saturday morning and then it's in sidbury uh that that sunday um at dead and sidbury but there at, at the point of um at the point of this releasing i think the next one won't be till january at horror on sea okay. so so we'll see what happens in between then there might be a i think we might have a couple of screenings lined up so we'll see Oh, great. We'll make sure we put them up on our, our Facebook, yeah. Twitter, and our YouTube as it comes along. Because I know lots of people love seeing it. Oh, yeah, yeah. thanks very much. I really appreciate it. You know, it's nice to kind of finally get it out there and get out of my system. It's, you know, it's really nice to be having a bit of downtime at home rather than knowing that I've got a film to slave away over. I mean, that won't <laughs> be lasting for long, don't get me wrong. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's nice to finally have, like, you know, nothing to do in that regard in, at home. You know, so it's nice to have that breather. Yeah. Gosh, at that. Great. Oh. You know, these films, they're just such a colossal kind of, you know, undertaking. But yeah. that's how we like them. <laughs> and then, of course, last thing, are there any other films that you're looking forward to that haven't come out yet or that you are you want people to keep their eye on? Oh, so many. Um, 
There's a good few at Horror on Sea in January, like Mosaic, uh, Burnt Flowers. Um, uh, what else? Oh, there's this one, I don't know if you've heard of it, The Witches of the Sands. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to do a video compilation of every single person mentioning witches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is that really generally has piqued my interest for so long because none of us know how it's going to kind of play out. We know, we know certain details and certain parts, but as a whole, it's just going to be so remarkable. Um, the trailer looks so, so good. And, you know, I've got all my faith in Tony that he's going to make something truly unique there. So mm-hmm. I'm really looking forward to that one. There's also a chance to see you be like a Rod Sterling type character. That must have been really cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was quite nice to slick my hair back and just kind of, you know, have a cigarette here. And <laughs> that was filmed at one of our, our local cemeteries around here. I uh, got my friend Baz to help me film that. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> I know, Great. So much. But um, I don't, you know, I don't know how that's going to ultimately fit into everything else. So that's part of the fun of it, I guess, really. But I've got my uh, I've got my top trump set here. There you go. Oh, nice! Taking pride of place on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> so many, so many films to look forward to. I am, um, but off the top of my head, those are a few. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Tom. Thank We've you. had a great time talking to you. It's been so much fun. Likewise, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm, I'm glad we finally managed to sync it up because it's been so long in the in the waiting, hasn't it? You know, we've been trying to get to get this sorted. So yeah. I'm glad we've been able to do it today. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. It was, it was great. It was great meeting you and talking to you. Likewise, Chris, we'll stay in touch, man. Yeah, touch, please. Definitely. Awesome. I'm, and I'm then always poking on the group. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually, it's a good good point. If people join join the the Facebook. How you can have a yeah. chance to say hi to Tom. <laughs> Facebook people. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thank everybody for listening, and we're gonna see you next month with a Clockwork Orange. See you then. All right. If you want to share your thoughts about this episode, please head to our Facebook or YouTube pages. We're grateful to Kukurbit who made our music. Thank you for listening, and please join us next time for the London Horror Movie Club. Thank you.